You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 143, Fit for an Autopsy. Hosted by Dan Terry. You want to try that again, Slugger? (laughs) Chris McCoy. Start to finish, it just punches you in the face. And Joseph Wren. We're all in this together, and you all sound the same. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you're fit for an autopsy because you're fucking dead, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. That is Chris. The process of human extermination is usually led by monkeys, if you believe Hollywood. Fair. I mean, or Terminators. Skynet. Yeah, but then you got to buy into time travel. Well, I love time travel. And naked time travel. I love nakedness and time travel. Why can I send biological bits through the time portal, but I can't send artificial clothing bits? It doesn't make sense. Makes tons of sense. You you solve time travel then, right? The problem is is that you're thinking about it and just don't think about it. Right. Let's go back to the DeLorean. See, it all makes sense now. You're still wrong about the second DeLorean in the cave, by the way. All, no, I'm not. <laughs> Let's break this down, and Joe can decide whether he wants to put it in the fucking podcast or not. Back to the Future 3. Marty gets sent back to 1885. Well, then, okay, Marty doesn't. At the end of Back to the Future 2, Doc Brown gets sent back to 1885 in the DeLorean. He then puts the DeLorean in a fucking cave and seals it up and leaves Marty instructions on how to find it in 1955. Marty, who's trapped in 1955, finds Doc Brown in 1955. They go. They find the fucking cave. They find the DeLorean. They fix up the DeLorean, and they send Marty back to 1885. Now, the whole crux of Back to the Future 3 is that they do not have gas in the DeLorean because Marty accidentally cut the fuel line, and they don't have unleaded gasoline. Here's the problem with that. Doc Brown says that the DeLorean always ran off of unleaded gasoline. Therefore, there was probably some unleaded gasoline in the DeLorean's fuel tank when Doc buried it in 1885. All they had to do was go back to the fucking cave and fucking leave a note on the DeLorean saying, hey, there's a bad fuel line. Put an extra tank of gas in the back of the DeLorean. Either that would have worked, or they could have siphoned gas out of the existing DeLorean and put it in the other one. It would have not affected the timeline at all and would have been a very easy solution to that problem. I'm right. I'm just letting you go. <laughs> anyway, we're, we're not here to talk about any of that shit tonight. Fit for an autopsy. You are witnessing the autopsy of what is believed to be an alien. Well, how do you not be fit for an autopsy? Let's, let's dig into that for a second. Still alive. Okay. You're not fit for an autopsy. So the only requirement is that you have to, in fact, be dead. You, as the subject of the autopsy, yes, you must be dead in order to undergo an autopsy to determine how you, in fact, died. Okay. (laughs) Sorry. Fit for an autopsy is a deathcore band from Jersey City, New Jersey, formed in 2008, and the most notable thing about them is that their guitar player is none other than Will Putney. Who's that? Has he recorded records? or He is an American record producer, mixer, and engineer. You may have heard some of his work with bands like Fork Today, The Acacia Strain, Body Count, Thy Art is Murder, Counterparts, North Lane, The Amity Affliction, Miss May I, Upon a Burning Body, and Straight from the Path. And that's not all. That's just some of them. When are we talking about Body Count, by the way? Well, I don't know, man. We, we really should get on that, shouldn't we? doesn't make a whole lot of sense that we haven't talked about Body Count. But this week, we're talking about Will Putney and his amazing guitar shredness. I think it goes without saying that this band's output sounds basically perfect. Like, I have no I have no complaints about the production quality. Yeah, starting at, you know, their first record, 2011, the process of, of human extermination. Like, most bands' first record, there's some questionable production value on it, but not with Fit. Yeah, I mean, not whenever their guitar player is Will fucking Putney. <laughs> it's kind of like having Adam D and Killswitch Engage. It's an advantage to have a producer in the band. He kind of knows what you need to do in the studio in order to sound good. You think he has fights with himself whenever he's recording guitar lines? Like, fuck you, Will, play it again. I think he writes the song in his head and says, this is perfect. Everybody's going to love this. The process of human extermination is probably one of the best album titles for this type of band that I could really ever imagine without it being too cheesy. This record starts off with a bang. I mean, we'll tear this whole fucking world apart. You get... 
intense vocals. There's no question about what kind of band you're listening to. This is deathcore through and through. Thematically, lyrically, musically, it's deathcore. The definition is deathcore. I'm okay with it. I don't have a whole lot to say about it because it's deathcore. Does it sound like deathcore? Yes, it does. Am I enjoying it? Yes, I am. It sounds like deathcore in the sense of heavy breakdowns, guttural vocals, but I think the thing that sets this band apart, even on their first record, is that the guitar work is significantly more complex than what you would get out of, like, a Thy Art is Murder or a White Chapel or an Impending Doom, who we've talked about, <laughs> because they're all about the breakdowns, and it's not that Fit for an Autopsy isn't, but there's more musical composition. There's more thought put into these songs. There's a lot more layered guitar guitar work over the top of the breakdown. Absolutely. And that's totally my shit. Because I don't want to feel like I'm just listening to the same song over and over and over again. And so that layered guitar is really, in a lot of ways, what differentiates each song from each other. Which is a huge problem in deathcore. A lot of deathcore albums just sound exactly the same from beginning to end. I'm not going to say that that these songs don't sound similar to each other, but the, if you if you have an ear for it, you're gonna you're gonna be able to differentiate the songs, and you're gonna find a lot of enjoyment out of it. Fit for an Autopsy is kind of a hard band to talk about because do you like heavy shit? I do. Do you like breakdowns? I do. Do you like guttural vocals? I do. Do you like pissed off lyrics? Let's get in the pit and fight right now. Totally. Who who wouldn't want to get into the pit to the false prophet? I don't want to get in the pit if Chris McCoy is throwing elbows again. Oh, God, that's that's rough. <laughs> I love these lyrics, too, because they're so angry. Like, what makes you think that you're the only fucking one worthy of a throne in a kingdom of gold? Selling your soul for the fortune and lies that you have told. False prophet of misery feasting on the minds of the weak. Twisting the words of dead men to suit your perverse beliefs. Disciple of dishonor. Loyal heir of unjust grief. Forked tongue and scales for skin. This dude's fucking pissed off. I mean, I don't really know what he's talking about. Like, <laughs> like, like maybe it's religion or maybe it isn't. I, I don't know. I, I, all I know is that he is the executioner. I'm afraid to say. I think he's just talking about a snake, dude. He might be talking about a snake, I mean, but he is the executioner. He is the badger, and he is looking at a snake right now. That is the theme of the song. I thought mongooses ate snakes. They are their mortal enemies. Okay. I just want to keep that. I'm sorry. I, I wish I could get, like, deeper into this, but, like, these songs are fucking heavy. They are intense. They are everything you want out of a solid deathcore release. I, I know, I know. It's, it, it sounds like we didn't listen to the albums, and I promise you that, that, that we did. <laughs> but this uh, this band is just rock solid, and I don't really know what else to say. Like, musically, their first album is incredible. Start to finish, it just punches you in the face. Yes. Uh, there's not a whole lot of melody to speak of here. It's just go for the throat, go for the throat, ten times in a row, and you're probably dead at the end of it. We're ready for Hellbound. I mean, I guess, yeah. <laughs> well, before we send Dan into hell with a chainsaw to slay caco demons, I want to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to this podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything discography discussion at discussmetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening, and now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. We love five-star reviews here on Discography Discussion. We love them because they make me happy. Another thing that makes me happy is when you guys share the episodes on social media. I see you guys doing it all the time, and I appreciate it, and I love it. And I know I said something about a contest a couple weeks ago, and I am working on that. Just give me a little bit more time, and you guys will be profiting from sharing. Profit sharing. 2013. Hellbound. Hellraiser 2. Sorry, I'm thinking movie mosh again. <laughs> I was thinking more like children of the corn syrup. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. I love it. Different vocalist on this one, right? I think the... The 2015 Absolute Hope, Absolute Hell is when the new vocalist shows up. Okay, well, I know they, they've had they've had a few vocalists. I could be wrong. They both sound fairly similar. To they, me. they really do. I mean, like, is there is there really a whole lot of differentiation it's between deathcore, dude? Yeah. What do you want me to say about the vocals? They sound like deathcore. 
I think Joe showed up in 2014 as the new vocalist, and this yeah. was recorded in 13. Well, I did do my best. They didn't want me around. They kicked me out. They said we can find a better guy. I said, I know someone named Dan. <laughs> oh, you weren't talking about me, were you? I was not. Okay, then. <laughs> Are you going to show us your best guttural, though? Uh, there is no guttural. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, a lot of guests on this vo- on this album. Um, it's you, a blessing and a curse. It's good and bad. Uh, it's not really bad. Track two, Still We Destroy, features CJ from Thy Art is Murder. Uh, Thank You, Bud Dwyer, features Nate from a band whose name I cannot pronounce. Uh, Zibalba? That sounds good, right? Is that like Zibalba from episode one? Good. We gotta, we gotta like start a podcast where we just talk about movies. Uh, track seven, There's Nothing Worth Keeping Here. It is Brooke Reeves of Impending Doom. Best breakdown on the record. Oh, my God, dude. And, you know, with Brooke fucking Reeves. Uh, Children of the Corn Syrup that I mentioned before features uh, Vincent from the Acacia Strain. That is also a fucking banger of a song. And then on the 10th track, you have Danny from Upon a Burning Body. And that song is called The Travelers. But musically, I think this album isn't as noodly as the last one. Yeah, I mean, fight me, you know, but like it's a. Uh, it's a little bit more straight ahead deathcore, I feel. It's not that it's bad, but like they do that deathcore thing where it's like breakdown, breakdown, chug, chug, some atmospheric noodling in the background, but like it's not as prominent on this record as it was in the last one. It's not to say that it's not there, it's just not prominent. Standout tracks on this record? Uh, Still We Destroy and There's Nothing Here Worth Keeping. Absolutely. That's a good one. I really like Tremors too, not the movie. Yeah, the sequel of Tremors too? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great sequel. No, this one's just Tremors. I, I enjoy Tremors also. <laughs> yeah, this record is, again, just punch you in the face, punch you in the face. This band is punch you in the it face. It is 100% punch you in the face. Like, how you can survive seeing a band like this play live, I don't understand, nor do I really want to witness or try. I, I saw them live last October. I remember because you were texting me being like, why the fuck aren't you here? And I was all like, because I'm a terrible person. And you're like, yeah, I know. I don't even know why I waste my time with you. They are going to be back here in November. Oh, I don't know if I can handle that. <laughs> with the last 10 <laughs> seconds of life, it's going to be brutal. The one thing about this record versus the last that stands out to me, I got a plea for purging marriage of heaven and hell vibe. The way the guitars were different very deliberately different from depravity the problem with deathcore as a style every guitarist is using the same set of tricks so you can choose to either use those tricks or you can try to just play straight heavy this has more heavy less atmospheric noodling like dan mentioned and focuses more on the riff but it all runs together for me on this one i like what i'm hearing but i don't remember it it's Hellbound. Okay, let me listen to that for the next 30 minutes. I can't tell you which songs I liked. They all sound good. It's all heavy. What else you got? There's no hooks other than the breakdowns themselves, which, I mean, I guess the breakdowns are the Welcome hooks. Welcome to Deathcore. <laughs> right, yeah. The breakdowns in Deathcore are the hooks. But uh, I do question the decision of bringing on a ton of guest vocalists that all sound basically like the main vocalist of the band. We're all in this together. And you all sound the same. They don't sound exactly the same. I mean, if you ha- again, if you have an ear for it, you're going to be able to pick them out. But I think, like, if I'm just listening casually, I'm not going to pick up on that. I'm going to be like, God, that's a banger of a breakdown. This is a banger of a song. This is fast. This is cool. They say things like, watch me wither. I'm just the salted fucking slug. Watch me wither. I mean, God damn. I'm just the salted fucking slug born to burn. Give unto the pigs what they <laughs> what they yearn. Give me hate in your handshake. Give me hell and pain. I embrace it. Born to die. Born to rot in a soup of flies. I don't want to say that these lyrics are not sincere, because they sound like sincere as fuck. But I also feel like it's just like window dressing for the sound. Like, lyrically, we have to match the sound as best as we can. If that's successful, then it's it's all good. But I do think it's just kind of weird. Like, some of the stuff they say is kind of weird. Like, pocket stuffer, motherfucker, soul stealer, bottom feeder. Just put me in the fucking ground. Ugly fucking gods. Ugly fucking heroes. Bow to your masters. Count your worthless fucking zeros. I love the song, Weatherman. <laughs> I, I do, too. But I just, um, that's the song that just, I'm like, what is this, what is this guy doing lyrically? Like, I don't know. Like, it, they're not bad lyrics, but, like, they're just... 
they're just there. They're very teenage angst. Like, it reminds me of listening to, like, old Cannibal Corpse lyrics and being like, yeah, hey, you hear how fucked up that is? I don't really listen to Deathcore, I guess, for the lyrical content. I, I put it on on the car ride home from work after a shitty day and, you know, bang it out in the car for 15 minutes on the ride home. Oh, come on, Chris. We know you listen to these whenever you're happy, too. I do. It's good <laughs> beer drinking music. I'm not going to lie. It's good beer drinking, set your neighborhood on fire kind of music. 2015. Absolute hope, absolute hell. So Dan Terry, with a chainsaw, descending into hell to slay caco demons. I feel like I've done this already, but it still applies. The cool thing about using a chainsaw on a caca demon is that for some reason, whenever you use it, it turns the sprite around. So they can't actually, like, they can't shoot at you. So using the chainsaw is actually the best way to kill those enemies in Doom. It's also really weird looking at the back of the sprite, because you may not have known this, but the caca demons have an asshole. Like, I never noticed it before, like, for years, but, like, I was playing it, like, a couple years ago, and I was like, oh, shit, they actually have an asshole, and that's, like, what I'm attacking them with the chainsaw. It's very strange. This record introduces kind of the... I guess it's kind of weird to say choral vocals... But like there's there's more like background shouted vocals going on on this. This is the first time we've heard that. Everything else has always been just like really straight ahead deathcore vocalist screams over the breakdowns, which absolutely does exist here. But like it almost sounds like there's a little bit of an effect on the vocals, not to like make them deeper or anything, but just like to almost make them sound more distorted. It's the 2015 production of double, triple, quad your vocals, double, triple, quad your guitars. It's unfair to say it, but it sounds like a record made by a guy who knows what he's doing in the studio. It's a record made by a producer, Will Putney, ladies and gentlemen. He did a good job. This record has a little bit more noodle, but it has a little bit less all the time. Just break down, trudge through the mud. It has that, but it's not there all the time. They almost back off just enough to introduce some more of that atmosphere, and now it's a little bit more a plea for purging. I find this one more listenable than Hellbound or The Process of Human Extermination. This is probably my favorite record by Fit. The song quality, like the songwriting is a little bit more advanced, and we get a little bit more of that like weird techie shit that we like so much, and it makes the songs stand out on this record more so than they have on the previous. I think uh, I think this is a different vocalist for sure, and uh, I love I love just the fucking vinegar that's like just dripping from his lips. <laughs> you know, like it's just you know it's, you're enjoying the cheese at this point, right? I, it is a little cheesy, and I and I'm okay with it because I like cheese. Like, there's no such thing as extra cheese, and that would be a bad thing unless you're lactose intolerant. And even then, sometimes it's worth it. But uh, you know, like. Yeah, I think this record had superior songwriting. And I think this is when Fit for an Autopsy stops being like Will Putney's band and, and actually being something on its own that's not like a pet project. Like it's a band that you can take out on tour and actually sell merch and and, and be a viable band. I will say it's one of my favorite like band names ever, Fit for an Autopsy. That's sick. It's almost as good as After the Burial. <laughs> when you were talking about um, songwriting for this album, I, when it comes to lyrics, I, we can't leave out False Positive, where he says about four or five times in a row, we're not worth our weight in shit. <laughs> You're right. But we know how to pile it up. <laughs> <laughs> Take your boots off before you get through the door, but the dirt still drags in deep, <laughs> deeper than ever before. <laughs> Break your back for the princes and bring the burden back home. The eyes of a child through a rifle scope. See you, see you, and you alone. <laughs> could you, could you have been the shoulder to cry on? Could you wear the leather skin? Could you have ever been bothered to let a stranger in? You don't know fucking pain. Well, I do now. I fucking know it. Fantastic record. I don't know, man. Put me in the fucking ground. Ugly fucking gods. 2017. The Great Collapse. That's funny, because I read the lyrics to Wither on the last the discussion on the last album. That's a fuck up. Does anybody want more Absolute Hope, Absolute Hell? I do. Does anybody not want more Absolute Hope, Absolute Hell? It's not that I don't want it, but I mean, listening to all these in a row like this, I was kind of starting to think, like, are you guys ever going to, like, switch it up? <laughs> this is a bad deathcore band to listen to in one week. 
It's not that deathcore is bad, but it's not bad. Nothing about what it are is you bad. listening to that is any different than the last thirty minutes of music that you created? Nothing. And if I'm listening to deathcore, that's exactly what I want. Nothing about it is bad, but it's like the Black Dahlia murder all over again. Wow, you guys are really fucking great at what you do, and you're gonna keep doing it because it's your job. Unpleasable Metal Fan has no problem with Fit for an Autopsy. Music Critic Man is like, what else you guys got? But the problem is, is like, whenever I say, what else you guys got, that doesn't mean I want, like, a bunch of clean vocals or you guys to go pop punk or, you know, like, I, I don't know exactly what I'm putting my finger on. It's just I'm wanting the band to sound a little bit different than what I've heard already. I feel like, I feel like this band kind of blew its load on the first two records. The stuff that they put out after that is just as good, if not a hair better, but it's not like a significant jump forward. And I, I just, I don't know if this band has that. Does that make it bad or less enjoyable? It does not. I can listen to this record and be completely satisfied with it in and of itself. But when I stack it up against the rest of what they've done, it's kind of like, oh, okay, so you guys just kind of kind of did the same thing again. Okay. Why is this band being so similar less appealing than, say, a plea for purging, who kind of changes up the atmospheric quality of their records throughout the discography. There's a distinctive difference between depravity and the life and death of a plea for purging. There's not that between The Great Collapse and Absolute Hope, Absolute Hell. I think other bands benefit from having a different producer on each record. Is that a detriment to fit for an autopsy, then, that the guy in the band is the producer? always has the same vision for every record and knows exactly what he wants it to sound like there's no creative drive there's no creative experimentation with your sound you walk into the studio with your amp already dialed in in your head and nobody challenges it because obviously it's will putney he knows what he's doing but sometimes self-produced is not as good as the outsider looking in i think a different producer can help you pull things out of your sound that you didn't know was there before. And I think with Will Putney it's one of those, it's so close to home and the fact that he writes pretty much most of it, if not all of it you know, like, he just there's the fit for an autopsy style and the vision and that hasn't changed like, they get they get a little melodic in places, which I like but it's never, it's never enough for me to be like, this is a truly different experience. But it doesn't have to be that either. Like, I'm, I'm really just trying to find something to say that gives me more content on this episode. Like, just to be honest, like, because this band, their first, first four records are pretty much like, you could listen to them as one giant record. 2019, The Sea of Tragic Beasts. We're back to the water. Well, speaking of what I was just saying, this record is a little different. It wasn't necessarily what I was expecting, but what I ended up getting, I actually enjoyed. I've only had one day <clears throat> to spend with this record, but I definitely, I hear a lot more, not a lot more, but it's definitely a little more melodic, If you know, comparing it to Fit for an Autopsy's first four records. It's kind of something different, is what you're saying. A little bit. They give you, I was going to say, <laughs> they, they still give you everything you got on the first four records. It's all there, but they've added a few things. Most notably, there are some, like, cleans in there. They're not like pop clean vocals, but there's there's a slightly more melodic sections on the songs. A couple of gang sing-alongs kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're a little bit more, um, I don't want to say sing-songy. That doesn't really describe anything this band's ever put out. But yeah, there, there's like vocal hooks that are delivered in kind of a kind of a cleaner style. And I think this band desperately needed that. Yeah, standout track on the new record. Uh, for me, which, I mean, we've only had a day to spend with it. Yes. So your pain is mine. It's got, it does have a little bit of melodic cleans, but they're kind of going back and having a little bit more of the guitar solo noodle-ness on it. Yeah, and I, I have, that, that's a great song. And uh, there was another one. I'm, I'm trying to remember what the what the song name was. Talking about Birds of Prey? No. I am talking about Warfare. Yes. I I think I texted you last night that this might be my new favorite Fit for an Autopsy song. One listen, and just I like the lyrical content of it. I like the heaviness. It's definitely the standout track of the album for me so far. I mean, that might change after listening to it a few more times. But like, I feel like they didn't really have that on any of these uh, previous records. Like they had they had standout breakdowns and riffs, but they didn't have standout songs in my opinion. And so I think this is the first time where 
they're trying to make this band, well, maybe not the first time, but a better realization of them trying to make this band into like a real thing instead of it just being Will Putney's band. And so, yeah, I thought this was really cool and different and uh, kind of suits, kind of accents their brutality really well. Uh, we talked about contrast in the in the Ginger episode. This is the band that desperately needed that. Like, they needed that contrast to make them more interesting to maybe a more casual listener, like somebody that's not necessarily into deathcore. Like, I feel like if you're just into heavy music, you could listen to this and find something. You didn't necessarily have to be, like, a Fit for an Autopsy fan. Final thoughts on Fit for an Autopsy. Chris. Uh, one of my favorite band names of all time, for sure. This is something I put on if I'm in a bad mood or if I'm in a good mood. Let's throw elbows. Dan, what about you? Do you like Will Putney? Do you like heavy shit? Here's five albums of that. I'm okay with it. It's not my favorite band in the world. Great band name, great image, great sound, great production value. You can't go wrong. It's a sure thing. Uh, I just wish that it was a little bit more diverse. I think Fit for an Autopsy is another band. If you're a fan of Deathcore, you are going to be 100% satisfied with what you have, regardless of which album you pick. I don't think they appeal to the masses. I don't think people as a whole are going to look to fit for an autopsy as the definitive deathcore band or even modern metal band. But I think they're a band to round out your collection. You don't always need the most innovative band in the world when you're looking for music that you like. Sometimes you just need a workhorse. And I think fit for an autopsy is a workhorse. It's all good. And give me more of it. Dan, what's your album of the week? It is Cattle Decapitation, Monolith of Inhumanity. It's a record I've been putting off listening to for years, and I was like, why was I putting this off? Chris, what about you? I'm going with uh, Sleep Talk by Dayseeker. These guys have kind of been under the radar, I feel like, for the last four or five years. Really good at what they do. Um, I think this is record number four. I could be wrong. might be number five. I'm not sure. Uh, they kind of have a genty, melodic sound, a lot of clean singing. Uh, if you're going to check out a track from the new record, Sleep Talk, I would go with Crooked Soul. Thank you, Discography Discussion, Discord Server, Rage of Light, Imploder. I've been digging it today. It was a nice change after all those Ginger albums I had to listen to. Had to. I did. It was a requirement. Hey, everybody. Dan here, your best friend in the entire world. I like my friends, and you're my friends. I like it when my friends talk to me. You want to talk to me? You want to talk to Joe? You want to talk to Chris? talk to us anytime you want to There's a lot of different ways you could do that you can reach out to us on facebook on facebook.com slash discography discussion you can send us a tweet at discuss metal you can send us an email at dan and joe show at gmail.com you can join our discord server where everybody's talking to us all the time there's a link in the show notes that'll take you right to our discord server so you can join in on the discussion there you can join the discography discussion official facebook group just send a request to join, and I will probably approve you. There's a variety of ways you can talk to us. We're on Instagram now. It's really cool. There's, like, pictures and, like, tags and all kinds of neat shit with that. So uh, check it out. Reach out to us. We're here for you, our friends. And on that note, this has been Episode 143 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please, send questions and comments to Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at Patreon.com forward slash Discuss Metal. We have some sweet perks. All over your face. Half open, have no fear.